And so we're, we just read John chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And uh, we're going to be studying that passage of Scripture tonight. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you in prayer, Lord, and we thank you and praise you, Lord. I lift my hands to the God of glory, and I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in my life. And, Lord, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and I'm not ashamed of you, Lord. And I pray that you would manifest yourself in our presence tonight, because the truth is, is that we need to hear what you would have to speak to your people. And so I pray that you would illuminate your word to your people tonight. I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. And I pray that you would prepare our heart, Lord, to receive the seed of your precious word so that it might take root in, in who we are and that it might bear fruit in our eyes. Because there's people out there that you're sending us to, Lord. There's people out there that you're sending us to and you desire that we be used in their lives to shine the light of Jesus in their lives, to be a light in a darkened world and salt upon this earth, Lord. Holy Spirit, You are the preacher and You're the teacher. And I pray that You would speak tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. One of the things that I noticed in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, really, was that we're having all kind of technical difficulties tonight. But one of the things that I noticed in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, were two concepts, really, in verses 1 through 3, and then also in verse 4, that I saw a common theme going on. And I mentioned some of this last week, but, you know, I want to say it again this week, that Jesus handles His business completely different than the world system. And what I began to see here is that two distinct situations, but in both cases, I think that we can take that concept from the text. And and that is, in verses 1 through 3, the Bible tells us that uh, when the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. I made the little map here because we've been kind of following the Lord and his disciples and John and his disciples because from the beginning that's really what the the story has been telling us. That John the Baptist was a witness that was sent to be a witness to the light. Amen. That Jesus was the light. That he was the way. John came to prepare a way for the way. Amen. We talked about the fact that the word way means in the Greek hadas. And it means an easily discerned path. The problem, and I know that I've repeated this, but let's catch some people up. The problem with the situation was, if you'll remember anything about the history of the Jews, that there had been 400 years of silence. The prophets had not spoken. God had not spoken to His people Israel for 400 years. And then God begins again with the spirit of prophecy. Through, uh, you know, He spoke through Mary. He spoke through Zacharias. He began to prepare the way. And through the birth of John, who was the voice that Christ cried out in the wilderness. He was the voice of, of, of the prophet to, to prepare ye the way of the Lord. Amen. And the word way again means hadas, an easily discernible path. The religion of the Pharisees had obscured the way to God. You know what I mean by obscured? It made the water murky. It was difficult to discern how to get to God. And I have to tell you that religion still does that today. You know that, right? That there's churches on every corner, and it does not necessarily mean that if you walk in a particular church that you're hearing the truth of the gospel preached. There's one way, there's one answer to the sin, the calamity of humanity, which is sin because it separates uh, humanity from God, and that plan is Jesus Christ and what He provided for us when He died on the cross. Amen. And so John the Baptist came to make the the mountains low, the valleys high, and to straighten out that which was crooked. That was his purpose. And we've been following their progress, and we're not going to go through all all the way through, but in John chapter 3, that's part of the context of what we're talking about. Another thing that that I've said throughout the study is that the Gospels are what you call narrative literature. And once again, narrative tells a story. And if you're going to understand a story and you're going to try to learn better what's going on here so that we can understand the communication, we have to understand the context of the story. And so what we're coming off of whenever it says here that Jesus, uh, when he heard that the Pharisees we're making a big deal about it, basically, that Jesus was baptizing more than John. If you'll remember the story uh, in John chapter 3, what was happening was Jesus was down here south in Judea. 
Okay, this is the whole nation of Israel. We've covered a lot of information regarding the nation of Israel and the, and the differences between Galilee and Samaria and Judea. But just suffice for time that Jesus was in the southern part of the country in Judea and John the Baptist was up north here closer to Samaria. And uh, uh, we believe, I believe, it was one particular Jew, the King James Version translates it plural, Jews, came and they questioned some of John's disciples and they said, hey, did you hear about the man down south that's baptizing and all people are coming to you, coming to him rather than you? And we got into the fact that it appears from the scripture pretty clearly that John's disciples became very envious very envious of what was going on with Jesus and it was starting to cause a ruckus. And now it appears from this passage of Scripture that the ruckus that was started here has actually begun to filter down south and Jesus has gotten wind of it. And what he's heard is is that the fact that it's the word's out. Jesus' ministry is, for lack of better words, blowing and going. He's the new thing on the scene and everybody's hearing about it and it's causing some uh, situation to take place. And Jesus makes the decision to leave and to go to the region of Galilee again, which is really where he was from. Nazareth was up here. But the interesting thing is, is that what we talked about last time, you know, you missed a lot of introductory information. So if you can get that particular CD, it was just actually an introduction to chapter 4. There were two routes that you could use to go to Samaria. And one route literally would go out of the way for the specific purpose to bypass Samaria. I'm sorry if I said two routes to Samaria, I meant two routes to Galilee. And one would go on the other side of the Jordan River, east of Jordan, and cut back across. That was the longer way. The shorter route actually went straight through Samaria to get you to Galilee. The point is, is this is that the Jews and the Samaritans had a very deep hatred for one another. There's no way that we can cover why that deep hatred was there. We talked about that in the last CD. There was many, many situations that had taken place. And basically, to make a long story short, the Jewish people down here south, that's where we get the word Jew from, felt as though the Samaritans were essentially half-breeds. And did not, they, their, their theology, they, they believed in a portion of the scripture. They only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. They didn't believe in the prophets. They didn't believe in all the prophecies that spoke of the, the, the Messiah coming from the seed of David. Okay? And so their theology was twisted. And it was not really, uh, you know, it was not full. It was not pure. And so there was a lot of confusion in their theology. All right, and so basically that's that's where we were last week, and I just wanted to point out so you could get kind of a picture there. But the, but the point is is this is that the first thing I saw about the difference between Jesus and how society responds, and when I say society, I mean yes, the community out there, the society, the world that we come into contact with, but not just them. Oftentimes, the modern church, because I'm starting to realize more and more. I don't know if you've seen it or not. But it appears to me that the church has been so infiltrated with the ways of the world that it's becoming very difficult to distinguish the two. Now, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, the fact that, you know, supposedly we, you know, we're not supposed to go around doing the party and stuff that we used to do. Let's just leave all that stuff aside. Okay, we know right from wrong and we know what it is we're, we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do when it comes to talking about gross sin. When we're talking about sins of vice and getting knee deep in it and the things that we used to do before we became saved, the things that we used to do before Jesus changed the inside of the vessel, we know we're not supposed to do those things anymore. Okay, the Holy Spirit has already spoken to everybody in this room and He speaks to people in churches across America each and every time we have a service. We know because the Holy Spirit has told us if we're born again, what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. I'm not talking about that tonight. Or or if I am, whatever. That's not the main emphasis. The main emphasis I'm trying to talk about right now is, is the way we handle our business. The way we respond to people, the way we talk to people, the way we think. See, the question that I have is, do we still think like the world rather than like Jesus? And in this first four verses, this is what I'm seeing here, is that Jesus has every right to not bypass this situation that's going on, but that instead to stand his ground and to say, hold on a second. See, John the Baptist was sent to be a witness to the light, but I am the light. And I have every right to stay here and to preach because that is what I've been called to do, to proclaim the truth of the kingdom. But instead, in humility, he does, it's not time yet. 
Now don't worry, when it's time, Jesus will stand his ground and he will bring correction where correction needs to be brought and he will tell some people some things that they don't want to hear. But the point to the matter is this, is that right here, right now, is not that time. And Jesus in humility, when he hears this situation taking place, he bypasses the whole situation and he goes towards Galilee. We know that what's going to happen is, is that he's, he ends up having this meeting with this Samaritan woman as he passes through Samaria. So that's the first thing I wanted you to see. It's a spirit of humility. And I don't know about you, but I've struggled with that as a Christian. I have. I, I, you know, there's oftentimes think, times, there's been times when I have felt as though, hey, wait, hold on a second. Don't, don't bypass. Don't, don't overlook. You know, whatever the case. But the truth of the matter is, is that the Holy Spirit is wanting me to respond more like Jesus and to be more concerned about what, what is good for the kingdom rather than what's good for Matt. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. But I'm here to tell you that that's the heart of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so... The next thing that I noticed is in um, verse 4, and we kind of we kind of pounded this a little bit last week, but we have to talk about it again, is that um, the Bible says in verse 4 that he must needs go through Samaria. Now in the King James Version, that that kind of causes a little bit of confusion just because of the way that the sentence is structured and the, and the grammar in the, in the sentence. But the point that, that, we, that we got from it is this. If you, if you kind of look at what the scholars say about this and what the, what the language is saying is that Jesus was being compelled. That's why Jesus didn't go the roundabout way that most Jewish people took to bypass the, Samar- the area of Samaria, but that instead Jesus was being compelled by the Holy Spirit because the Father had a desire for Him to have this encounter with this Samaritan woman. So the Bible says that Jesus must, must needs go through Samaria. The point is, is that <clears throat> Jesus wasn't like the rest of society. See, we're going to find a whole lot out about this woman before we're done with this story. And as a matter of fact, we're going to find some things out here in a second tonight about why she was going to the well at the particular time she was going to the well. Things weren't going real well in this woman's life. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that most Jewish people would not have given her the time of day. And most Jewish men would have never been caught dead talking to this woman in public. I'm just telling you what the truth is. The context of the history of Israel at this time was that, number one, the Jews did not, they looked very much down on the Samaritans, but also men looked down on women. And a rabbi considered a teacher, a great teacher, would not have been caught speaking in public with a woman uh, of of this type in this particular situation. But I wanted you to, I wanted to remind you that what I was trying to say is, is that Jesus isn't like the world. And Jesus isn't even like the modern church. See, I don't know about you, but, but I've, I've, been in, I've been in churches where, uh, you know, people that maybe don't dress as cool or maybe don't smell quite as good or whatever the case aren't treated with the same. See, the, the, the scriptures are real clear. That you don't get, elevate a person just because he has nice clothes and money in his pocket versus someone else who maybe doesn't have those things. But no, instead, for some reason, because the church is filled with people that are more worried about themselves than they are about the hurting of the world, it still happens today. And I'm here to tell you that that was not the heart of Jesus. And yes, you know, hey, if the shoe fits, wear it. And what I mean by that is, is that hopefully I'm not talking to anybody here tonight. But if I am, I think that the Lord wants us to be aware that that kind of stuff still goes on, but that the heart of Jesus is beating for all those out there that are hurting, that life has beat them up, that, that life has taken you know, advantage of them, and that they need to see the real Jesus step forward, a Jesus that's full of love and a Jesus that's full of compassion. Recently, talking still along those lines of the way the world thinks, the way some in the modern church, church think and the infiltration that we're seeing in the church today of the world's mindset. I just recently went to an engagement party for my nephew over the weekend. And in case my nephew and his lovely fiance ever hear this CD, I just want to make it clear that it was a 
beautiful venue, you know, I liked the way the, the where the, the thing was held and, um, you know, it, it represented a, a beautiful thing that they're going to be uniting themselves in marriage, amen, I hope that they understand that they're taking covenant, they're entering covenant with God, amen, and that it's not just a covenant amongst themselves and that if things don't still look the way that they did 10 years ago whenever they got married, you entered covenant with God, amen, and you can't just run out the back door when things don't go your way, hallelujah, you, you, now you're in covenant with God. Amen. And and and, and you get, the question is: Are you going to serve him, or are you going to serve self? All right. So anyway, I didn't mean to get into all that. What I wanted to say was is that we we were here, and what I started to notice is this: is that there was a facade going on. The Lord's just been beating me up with this stuff lately. Just noticing what people are caught up in. If you begin to listen to the conversations that take place at gatherings like this, this gathering, and then, you know, every year I go to a gathering for Christmas. And if you begin to listen to the conversations that people are caught up in, you begin to realize that it seems as though everybody's trying to head in the same direction. What I mean by that is, is that if you have the right kind of job or you have the right kind of profession, you know, you're heading on the right track. Everything is revolving around what have you accomplished, or at least the group of people that were at this gathering. What, are, what, what is it that you've accomplished in life? And it seemed as though to me that everybody there, in the source of their conversation, you're getting a glimpse inside of their heart, inside of their mind and how they're thinking that everyone there is, is caught up in chasing this pipe dream of more money, big, nicer cars, bigger houses, right? And, and actually not just chasing it, but almost attempting to act as though they've attained it. And I know good and well that the majority of the people in that place hadn't attained what it is that they were wanting to attain. But, you know, you can fool people if you wear the right clothes. You slap the right shades on your mug every now and then. Now, don't get me wrong. I like nice sunglasses. That's not the point. The point is, are you caught up in the image? That's what the, that's what the word the Lord's been beating me up with tonight. I don't know why, but he wanted me to tell you that tonight. Are you caught up in the image? Are you caught up in the persona of what the world is trying to communicate to everybody around them? Is that, what's, is that how you think? Okay, because I'm going to tell you something. There was one couple in that place that I know for a fact that had attained to the level that most of the people in that place wanted to attain to. I'm not here to talk, but they had prestige in the community. They had longevity of success. They've been in business for a long time. They got money. Trust me. This, is, this wasn't fake to where we put on a show and we don't have nothing but really a bunch of debt because you can make yourself look rich. Everybody in here ought to know that. But the majority of America is living in debt and they really don't have what it is that they're portraying that they have. But this particular couple had it. I'm telling you, bro. If that's what you're looking for in life, this couple had it. But can I tell you something? I would no more want to be the way that them people were than the man on the moon. They, they, their whole life is built upon falsity. Their whole life is built, it's a facade. It's, it's, it's fake. There's no substance to it because they don't have a relationship with God. And I don't know how I really got twisted off into this other than to say that Jesus' way of thinking... Jesus' heart was completely different than what the world system is showing. Amen? Jesus' heart is about doing the Father's will. Jesus' heart is about being led by the Spirit and not being consumed with what the world thinks. Because i got to tell you something. If you're caught up and concerned about what the world thinks, I can about tell you that you will not accomplish much for the kingdom. I'm just here to tell you that right now. And I know it because I was there. <laughs> And I'm not saying I don't have a lot of growing to do because we all got a lot of growing to do. But I'm here to tell you that if you are consumed and concerned with what the world thinks about you and the perception of how the world views you, you will not get much accomplished for the, for the kingdom. It's just not going to happen. Another thing that I was thinking about and using this as, a, uh, as an example or an illustration... I've seen something, I work in pediatrics, I'm, you know, most of you know I'm a nurse practitioner and I work in pediatrics. And one of the, one of the things that I really uh, have a desire to talk to people about is, is discipline, biblical discipline for children. Because, you know, you probably don't see it too often, but I see it every day that these kids nowadays, man, I'm telling you, it's bad. They don't, they don't respect their parents, you know, they, they, they just back talk and... Um, I, 
you know, I have parent mothers, single moms that come in and they they cry because they don't know what to do. I have moms that have the, the father in their life, but the father doesn't get involved in the child's life, you know, just kind of more like a friend kind of thing. And these kids are out of control, you know. And one of the things that I've noticed in this situation as we go, I begin to talk to these young people is that they're not real certain about the right thing to do. It's not that they don't want to do the right thing. They're just not certain about what the right thing is. Because, you see, there's at least two schools of thought out there. You have the school of thought of psychology, which tells you basically you should never spank a child. And I'm not here to jump on a soapbox about spanking. That's not my point. My, you know what? You want to know what my philosophy of discipline is? You're the parent. They're the kid. You need to be the authority in the home, and they need to understand that. I'm not talking about screaming and hollering all the time. I'm talking about, yes, love and compassion. They need to understand, but they need to understand who the boss is. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying that there's never going to be a circumstance or a situation that you don't have to remind them, but for the most part, they need to be respectful. And if they're not, amen, you need to correct that situation. But what I've noticed is is that these young parents, they they, they don't... They're not willing to take that step to be forceful, to be firm. It maybe is a better word. To be firm with their children because they're uncertain what the right thing to do is. Because psychology is telling them one thing, and in their mind, old school theology is telling them something different. Amen? Well, it's the same kind of concept with this that I've learned as I begin to walk with Christians for the last, about the last 12 years. I feel like there's a lot of Christians that I've had exposure to that are uncertain. They're uncertain of what the right thing really is. And what I mean by that is, is how is it that I walk properly with God? How is it that I have victory, amen, in my relationship with God? Because there's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of people that are saying that there's this road to victory and there's this way to victory and there's this program and if you'll take these steps, it'll get you to where it is that you need to go. But I'm here to tell you that that's, that's not going to bring victory in your life. Amen? There's one right way. God provided the right way. He sent His Son to die on a cross, not just to pay the penalty for your sin so that you can walk on streets of gold. Hallelujah. He did that. But to break the power of sin in your life. I'm here to tell you that's what the Word says. I'm here to tell you that's what Jesus came to do. I'm here to tell you that you can have that victory in your life today. Because the Holy Spirit moves through that. And He will strengthen you and He will empower you. And help you to be the witness that you need to be. So that you can quit being concerned about what the world perceives. Amen. You need a good dose of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. So that you can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that you can be the witness that God has called you to be. So that you and I can be a light in a darkened world. Amen. Because that's what this whole thing is about. So that's what I, that's the, 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 the issue basically where God wanted me to talk to you. About the difference in the perception of what the world sees. What society sees. Modern America. What modern America perceives as the right way. You know what I'm saying? Versus what Jesus... See, God never, never changes. And if God's heart was about people and humility then, and about helping the hurting, and about not being selfish but selfless, then His heart is still the same today. The church might change, but Jesus' heart will never change. Amen? Let's look at verse 5. John chapter 4, verse 5. The Bible says, Then he comes to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. The little title that I put next to verse 5 under Roman numeral 2 says that when you connect yourself to the world, you often get caught up in their ways and their mess. Now, the reason I said that was is because, you know, last week we talked about the fact that in this passage of Scripture, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of tradition. There's a lot of religious history in here. What I mean by that is this, is that, well, right here, you just look at that. Parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Okay? And the fact that in verse 6, you see that, that Jacob's well was there. Now, you got to understand something. I said this last week, but let me say it again. This woman is going out to this well every day of her life. And what she knows is this. She knows that this is a plot of ground that was given to Joseph by his father Jacob. And she knows that Jacob dug a well there. 
So they're maybe up here, and all, and, and the Jews are down here saying that they have the right way to worship. And we'll see that as we travel on in the story, her and Jesus' dialogue as they continue to talk about it. But the point that I want you to know is, is this, is that she, she definitely has some association with the things of God. There's a history in this town, if you will, in this area of the patriarchs. You know, you're familiar with the 12 tribes of, 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 you know, 12 tribes of Israel, which is Jacob's, you know, 10 of them are Jacob's sons, and then two of them were Joseph's sons, uh, that were the, the original founders of the nation of Israel. And so the patriarch, one of the original patriarchs, Jacob, gave this plot of ground to his son Joseph. We also learned that in this area where they are, I put this is Sychar, there were two mountains. And that this area where this well was was really right between these two mountains. And one of the mountains was called Gerizim, and the other one was called Ebal. Now there's a lot of rich history behind that, and you can go back and listen to the CD. And the history behind that is, is that in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses told a certain amount of tribes to stand on this mountain, Gerizim, and to pronounce blessings over the people of Israel whenever they were going to enter into and cross the Jordan enter into the promised land. And on this mountain right here, he told them to speak curses over those people who would end up choosing not to continue to walk in covenant with God, but that instead would marry themselves to the world and break covenant with God. And so there's a rich history of religion and tradition that's associated with this area. I just wanted you to understand that because there's a lot of people that are sitting in churches today that have been involved in church and have been exposed to church and have been exposed to various things and ought to know the right thing but not necessarily doing the right thing or not necessarily really walking in the right thing. Amen? But specifically what I wanted you to see is this, is that when it says that this is a parcel of ground that Joseph gave to, uh, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, you have to go back and you do a little study and I have the verses in the, in the, in the uh, notes for you, but you can go back and you can read Genesis 33 and you can read the end of Genesis 33 and read Genesis 34 and then also in Genesis 48:22. In Genesis 48.22, Jacob, whenever he's actually pronouncing the blessing over his sons, tells Joseph that he's going to give him this parcel of ground that he received by the sword. Now the interesting thing is, is that if you go back and you read Genesis 33, you'll remember, and this is going to hopefully open up and shed a little bit of light on this whole history thing, if you remember this. If not, it's a good little history lesson. That whenever Jacob went into the land of Shechem, he, made, he, he purchased property from a man named Hamor. Okay, so he did negotiations. He made a business deal with a man named Hamor. And you can read about that in the, in, in, in the end of Genesis chapter 34. But in the beginning of Genesis chapter... Does anybody have a, a, a whole Bible that they can turn to Genesis chapter 34 for me real quick? And we're going to... Um, Read the first two verses. So in Genesis 33, I think it's verse 19 and 20. Genesis uh, 34, verse 1 and 2. 34, what? You're gonna, uh, it's 34, verses 1 and 2. But in Genesis 33, verses 19 and 20, the Bible tells us that Jacob... You got it? The Bible tells us that Jacob made this deal with this man named Hamor. But now look at, look at what happens in the next, the next chapter. And Dinah, chapter 34, verse 1, the daughter of Leah, which she bore unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Now I want you to understand something that it might seem innocent enough where it says that that she went out and she saw the daughters of the land. But I have to tell you that that word see there means to observe closely and to present oneself to them. Essentially what happened was was that Dinah connected herself to the daughters of the world. You got to understand what I'm telling you here tonight. The God has always been very explicit with regarding his people. 
And, he, and what he has asked his people to do is to remain separated from the world around them. To live a life that is distinct from the world around them. Because let me tell you something. If you, and you know what? This may, not, this may not tickle your ears, but I'm telling you this is the word of God. If you and I don't live a life of distinction and a life of separation from the world around us, how will they know that there's a real God in heaven? They got a whole lot of people talking about God. there's a God out there. They got people that say that they're dying for their God and flying airplanes in the buildings and people are like well that doesn't sound like a good God but then you got Christians who keep falling on their face amen and I know I've been there okay and keep falling on their face and, 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 and saying one thing out of their mouth but living their life a different way I don't mean to be too hard but at the same time God has been clear he expects his people to live a life of separation and to be distinct Amen? But yet Dinah, what she does is, she goes and she connects herself to the world. And the Bible says that this prince, this man named Shechem, he lies with her and he defiles her. And the word there, defiled in the Hebrew, means that she basically became polluted. And so what she did was she connected herself to the world. She, she entered that situation, that social engagement one way. And I'm not saying it was her fault that she got raped. Please don't misunderstand me. It wasn't. But the problem is, is that she was not supposed to connect herself to the world to begin with. She was not supposed to have relationships with the daughters of those people to begin with. Those people worshipped false gods and they engaged in sinful practices. And the next thing you know, she's connected. See, and I've said this before in the Bible study, but let me say it again. God, is, God has never asked you and I to isolate from the world. He's only asked us to separate from the world. I've tried to explain this to my daughters that, you know, whenever they go off to college, see, I do the best job that I can, I'll be honest with you, as I raise them in the home. And one of the best things that I can do for my kids is ask God to give me the grace to live my life before them. Now, I, I fail sometimes. But I'm not too big to go and humble myself and apologize to my kids whenever I make a mistake. But I'm here to tell you something. I can tell them with a strict mouth all day long what they need to do. And if I cannot live it and be an example before them, it's like Charlie Brown's teacher. They're not listening to that. And I tell them all day long. Let me tell you something. God, dis- God and, and you know what's hard? Let me tell you what's hard is that whenever other people in the church aren't living a separate and distinct life, whenever the kids around them aren't living a separate and distinct life because those kids' parents have not instilled that in them. And those kids in the church are just watching what their parents are doing and they're doing the same thing. And it becomes very difficult for my, for my kids, or at least they say it is, to make a determination on what's right and what's wrong. I mean, yeah, they hear their dad, but they hear him all day long. And they're like, Dad, I hear what you're saying, but so-and-so's mama listens to such-and-such. So-and-so's mama goes here and does this. The, the, so-and-so's parents let them do this and there's confusion see what I'm saying but God has never asked us to isolate he has only asked us to separate and so what I've told my daughter is this listen I hope that you can respect me enough to believe that what I'm telling you is the truth but the truth of the matter is this one day you're going to have to walk out of this house and you're going to have to go enter that big old world on your own and you're going to have to go find Jesus for yourself they ain't got no grandkids I told somebody that in the clinic today the truth of the matter, you know, his mama was a woman of God, but I let him know. God ain't got no grandkids. You ain't getting in on your mama's faith, bro. You're going to have to receive Jesus for yourself. And, and my daughters are going to have to make a determination for themselves. But I've let them know, don't think that you're going to go out there and connect yourself to the world like Dinah did and not come back polluted. Don't think that you're going to go connect yourself to the world and play games with them and not getting trapped. Don't think that you... And I told her, I said, let me tell you something. You know what it happened is, you ever watch Scrooge, the story, what, would it, what is it, the Christmas story? And Yeah, Christmas Carol, that's it. And what happens? The ghost of Christmas, what does he do? He got chains clanking. Because he's all bound up and he's chained up. And I told my daughter, because she had watched that, so it was a reference point we had in common. I said, don't come back over here like the ghost of Christmas past at this house acting like your daddy never told you. Because that's what happens, folks. See, we get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. Jesus did everything He needed to do. At Calvary's cross, He broke the power of sin in our life. And I believe that everybody in this room believes it. Amen? But you know what happens sometimes? I'm going to tell you something. 
Sometimes we are so used to living our life a particular way. Amen. That it becomes, at least for me, that's how it was. We lived our life for so long a particular way that, that we, it, it has become ingrained in who we are. And the scripture is real clear that it says that whenever we get saved, the old man dies in Christ and that a new man is resurrected. Paul told the Ephesian church, take off the old man, put on the new man. Amen. But I don't know about you, but as a Christian, I struggled with that because I didn't understand. And it was almost as though I felt like I could, I could sip that sin just one more time. And maybe if I sipped it just a little bit, I'd be able to come out unscathed. You see what I'm saying? But I have to tell you, that's not how it worked out for Matt. I have to tell you that it became a bigger and a bigger mess. It was like a snowball going downhill and it was picking up momentum. And, and, and you know what? By the end of it, whenever breaking finally came, it wasn't really... I wasn't that far away from where I was whenever I first got saved. The good news of it is, is that God is merciful. And the good news of it is, is that we learn through those trials. Amen. God doesn't waste anything. And so this is certainly not a message of condemnation for anybody here tonight, because I don't even know where everybody is in their walk. But what it is, is a message of hope. It's a message of hope and my hope that the children of God would come to the place where, you know what, they get sick and tired of sipping sin. Because I don't know about you, but what I found out the hard way was, is that it wasn't no better this time than it was the before. But I had to come to a point of breaking before and pain before I really came to that determination. Because as long as you and I are willing to love on something more than we're willing to love on Jesus, I mean, think about that. If, God, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and revealed to you that something in your life is sin, we're not talking about Matt talking tonight, I'm talking about whether the Holy Spirit is talking has talked to you. And if the Holy Spirit has talked to you about something in your life and you know it's not right and we keep going back to it. Now we already know, we all agree that Jesus has already set us free. Do we not? We all agree. And so if we keep on going back to it, it just, yeah, let me, let me give you an illustration. All this is off the cuff. This doesn't have any, it's sitting in the notes. But I can remember one time there was a guy crossing place. Man, I'll tell you what, this dude, he seemed to really love the Lord. He'd call me up every time he'd mess up and he'd, he'd say, Matt, I don't understand what's going on, man. I love Jesus, you know, and I would just try to pour into him. And one time, you know, he went on a binge for about three or four days and he came back and he talked to the pastor. And me and the pastor were talking. I was like, hey, how's that guy doing? You know, he's called me several times, whatever. And he said, he said, you know, Matt, he said, I didn't, he said, I really didn't want to do it, but I did because it was kind of like the same thing was happening over and over again. And he said, I don't understand. The guy told pastor, he said, I don't really understand what's going on. He said, I know I love Jesus. And my pastor told him, he said, I don't doubt you love Jesus, man. He said, you just love crack cocaine more than Jesus right now. And the truth of the matter is, is that that was a hard word, but that was a real word. Because the fact is, is that until we've had enough and realized that the king of crack is not doing what's best for Matt, or that the king of fornication is not doing what's best for Matt, or that the king of whatever plug in your little sin in the blank is not doing what's the best for Matt, until I come to the realization of that in Matt's heart, I'm going to keep going back to it. But when I get sick and tired of being sick and tired and I get, you know what I'm saying? After this thing has had its way in my life and I get tired of it having its way in my life, then, amen, I may fall to my knees with a heart of brokenness and cry out to God and say, Lord, I know you've set me free. I need it manifest in my life. Why would I even sit here and harp on all this tonight? Because I'm here to tell you that the times are short. You hear me? The times are short and that there's people out there that are in pain. And they need to hear the truth of the gospel. And if you and I cannot stay focused enough on our relationship with Jesus so that we can live a life of distinction and think differently than the world does and look differently than the world does, then they may very well, amen, end up in a devil's hell. All right. Let's see here, verse 5. She got connected to the world, Dinah did. And uh, she represented God's covenant people. She was Jacob's child. And, you know, I, I was started to say that it may not seem like this story really coincides with what we're studying about, but the truth of the matter is, is that it does. Because what we're going to find out about this Samaritan woman is that she herself uh, was looking for fulfillment in things that were not going to bring it to her. 
and that the reality of it is is that what they did was they led, led, a, led her down a trail of heartache after heartache after heartache and left her just as empty as she ever was before. And that's exactly what happened with Dinah's decision when it was all said and done. It defiled her and it caused a landslide. I would encourage you to go back and read the whole story because it's a very interesting story. It caused even more people to sin because what ended up happening was was that her brothers went back and slaughtered all those people. He tricked them into going into covenant with him and he caused them to circumcise themselves and they all when they waited till they were ripe with fever and they went in and slaughtered them all. And that's how Jacob ended up getting that property through the sword that he ended up giving to Joseph. And that's where we are right here. This meeting. I just wanted to give you some of the, the background history of what's going on, at least in the geography of, of where we are here. Let's look at verse six real quick. Um now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his... sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There were at least two points that I wanted to make here. The word wearied, it literally means to be exhausted from toil, work, or grief. I wanted to make a point to you here that God doesn't get tired. Did you know that? Genesis, I mean, Psalm 121 says that He's the God of Israel and He doesn't slumber. I need you to understand that God does not get tired, nor does He get hungry, nor does He get thirsty. Yet Jesus became all three. The reason I point that out is, is that because a lot of times in the church, at least my early years in the church, we, ha- we did not, the pastors that I sat under, I'll just say it like it is, I'm not trying to be rude or ugly, did not do a good job of presenting the humanity of Christ to me. I need you to understand something, that Jesus never stopped being deity. You do realize that. Intrinsically, who he was, I mean on the inside, who he was, his core, his nature was deity. At the same time, he was complete humanity. But what I need you to understand is is that while Jesus walked on the earth, he did not perform miracles, he did not perform ministry, he did not walk as God. That was not the plan. you got to trust me on this. The Word of God says that Jesus was the second Adam. Jesus came to make right what the first Adam made wrong. The mission and the ministry was to function as a man and to live life as the perfect man and to offer that perfect life as the perfect sacrifice so that He could pay the penalty for your sin and for my sin. Judgment of sin has already taken place and it was done on Jesus at Calvary. I told the person in the office today, Jesus has already died for the sin of the entire world. But judgment is coming. Because if you your sin has not been judged on Christ... Your sin will be judged on you. There's a day coming. But I'm here to tell you that the good news is, amen, is that Jesus has already paid the price. But I wanted you to see that thing about His humanity because He was weary. He was tired. I need you to understand that Jesus as the man... Because see, look, people have made this comment before and I've heard it. Well, you know, Jesus' heart was softened and compassionate towards those who were less fortunate. Jesus didn't mind being seen with the lepers. Jesus didn't mind. You remember the time that Jesus was sitting in the, in the, in Simon, I'm not Simon, the Pharisee's house, and they were eating, and the sinful woman comes in, and she begins to wash his feet with her tears, and wipe it with her hair, and the Pharisee says in his heart, well, how would you like to eat at the table with Jesus? Because he'll call you out about what you're thinking. The, the, the Pharisee says in his heart, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch him. And Jesus said, you know, Simon, not Simon, you know, he tells the Pharisee, he says, you didn't even have a servant wash my feet, which was really a disgrace. He said, but this woman hasn't stopped washing my feet with her hair, you know, and that to whom much is forgiven, much love. The point that I'm trying to make to you is, is that Jesus did not think like the world. Jesus did not mind being seen with the less fortunate of society. But I have to tell you that, I know I said it earlier, but I'm reminding you again so that maybe you and I, myself included, will start thinking about this more often. That there's people that are in the very churches that we attend that might just need somebody to talk to them. Give them an encouraging word. Stop and say something to them. Amen. Because they're in pain. And not for us to walk around here with this mentality like the world and think that we're above other people. Okay? And and so what, what people have said, though, is they've made comments like, yeah, but you got to understand, Jesus was God, and I'm not Jesus. How many times have you heard that? 
Or Jesus, yeah, He lived His life without sin, but Jesus was God and I'm not Jesus. Now I have to tell you something, that Jesus resisted temptation as a man. you got to hear me on this. Think about it. Now you need, we need to be thinkers in the church. I'm going to tell you something. We cannot just sit in the pew and let somebody talk. I mean, I trust my pastor. Okay, but I want to have the spirit of a Berean. And it said, the Bible says in the book of Acts that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And they went home and they studied the scriptures for themselves after they heard what Paul preached to them. Now, how many of you know if they went home and studied what Paul preached to them, that you and I sure better be going home and studying what's being preached to us? Amen? And the truth is, is that I just want you to know that... I lost my train of thought. That, that basically what I wanted you to know is, is that Jesus is loving and He's kind and He's compassionate. Amen. And He wants us to be the same way. And, and that, oh, I was talking about His humanity. And I was talking about the fact that He endured temptation as a man. Amen. And that, and that He did not vacillate between deity and and humanity depending upon the situation. Like in other words, oh no, this this temptation's too rough for me as a man. I think I'll step into my deity role. I need you to think about these things. I need you to because listen to me, this is what I was gonna try to tell you. Is that if Jesus at any point in time resisted sin as God, all bets are off. You can close the book, bro. Because that ain't it don't work that way. Because God is not the one that sinned. God is not the one that failed. It was humanity that failed. It was Adam that failed and took sin into himself and was the procreator of the entire human race and spilled his infected seed into the entire human race and that that's why everybody's been born with a sinful nature. That's why Jesus had to come as the second Adam, amen, and to live that life as a perfect sacrifice. So that's the first thing I wanted you to see. Jesus was weary. I wanted you to take notice of his humanity. I wanted you to ponder on that. I want you to think about that. I want you to know that you can have victory over sin today because Jesus went before you and as a man he endured temptation and he went to the cross as a perfect sinless man. Amen. And he died on the cross for you and for me. And that through what now we have access to his spirit, you and I can also walk in victory. So don't walk around here thinking it's okay to sip a little sin every now and then and say, oh yeah, but I'm not Jesus. No, I'm here to tell you that ain't going to fly, bro. It's not going to fly whenever you stand before the Lord. If there was another way, you know, besides God giving His Son, I think He would have chose that other way, but there was no other way. Amen. Amen. That was the plan, bro. That was the only way to fix it. If you think about that plan a little bit and you chew on that for a while, you'll start realizing more and more how unbelievably smart God is. Amen. If there was another way, you would have took it. That's right. There wasn't no other way. Not much you love me. Um, the second thing I wanted you to see, the first thing was, was I wanted you to take note of his humanity. The second thing is this, is that it was about the sixth hour, the Bible says. Now, the Jewish clock started at 6 a.m. So that means at the sixth hour, it was noontime. That means that the disciples had started walking from some point. I don't know exactly where. Maybe they had walked a little bit the night before and camped out. But they started probably at the sixth hour when the sun rose, maybe a little bit before the break of dawn, and they had been walking. In the heat, and now it's in the heat of the day, and it's 12 noon. The disciples have gone on to town to buy food, and Jesus, weary and thirsty, sits down at the well. Amen. And the point I wanted to bring out to you about the sixth hour is this, is that that was not the normal time that women would go to draw water. I need you to, we can't pass over this. The normal time background commentaries over and over again tell you that this was not the normal time for a woman to go out and draw water in the middle of the day, in the noonday sun, in the heat. And that instead they would draw water in the morning or they would draw water in the late evening. But yet this woman goes to the well at a time whenever no one else is there. Now, as you and I begin to study and begin to learn a little bit more about this woman, just uh, real quick, bringing out the point that it was the sixth hour, and according to the Jewish clock, that meant 12 o'clock, and that that was 12 o'clock noon, and that that was not the normal time to draw water at the well for a woman. 
And if, as you and I begin to read more and understand more about this woman's lifestyle, and we begin to realize what she was caught up in, We can infer from the Scriptures. I can't tell you definitively or I can't tell you with certainty that this is the case. But this is not me coming up with this. This is scholar after scholar and this is good biblical interpretation. We can infer from the Scriptures that she was avoiding more than likely ridicule, more than likely ostracism because of the fact of her lifestyle. And that she showed up to that well every day at a time whenever the other women of the town weren't going to be there. And that she was living a life of pain. I wanted you to understand that. And you know, I don't know, have you ever stopped to think about how cruel life can be? How much the world will come against you when you don't do things their way, but then even whenever you do do things their way, if you do a little bit too much of it, they'll turn on you and stab you in the back. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the heart of the enemy. And so we can infer from the Scriptures that that's what's going on with this woman here, is that she's being ostracized, she's being ridiculed by society, she feels left out, she feels separated, she's hurting, and she's in pain. I don't know about you, but I I know that there's a lot of people out there like that. Amen? Alright, let's go ahead and take a look at verse 7. And verse 8. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus says unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away unto the city to buy meat or to buy food. That's the King James Version for the word food. And uh, so what I, want to, what I wanted you to know is, is that the disciples have gone away to buy, to buy food. And here she comes to the well. Amen. And uh, Jesus asks her to draw water for him. So he's thirsty. Now, most commentators will tell you that there there was a tool that oftentimes was used. It was a stick with maybe a fork on it and it had some type of a skin or a bladder of some sort on the end to stick down into the well to be able to dip the water out and then to pour it in the bucket, whatever your vessel was that you were using to fill it up with. The point that I wanted to make to you now, you know, I hope you don't think I'm taking a stretch here, but looking at this from a spiritual implication is that Jesus had no tool to draw with. Jesus had a need and he had no way to get it for himself. But yet she had something in her hand and she was able to provide and to serve the Lord himself with something that he didn't have access to at that point in time. And, and you know what the Lord began to speak to me through this is that God has placed in each and every one of our hands gifts and tools that have given us connections, amen, to the people out there. I'm trying my best to let the Bible preach to you today and it just keeps telling the same thing over and over again to me that there's people out there that are hurting. There's people out there in pain. Jesus has provided the way and He needs you and I, amen, to begin to walk in the covenant that He's provided for us, to begin to walk in the victory that He's provided for us because I don't know about you, but when that, before I began to walk in some victory, what ended up happening was the enemy would speak, whisper in my ear. And what he would tell me is, is that don't you open your mouth and talk about that man named Jesus because you know good and well what we did last night. You know good and well the, the, the relationship that you and I have. That you over there are sinning in the closet. Nobody else knows about it. So don't you dare open your mouth and talk about this man named Jesus. That's how the devil talked to me. I don't know how he talks to you. And I'm here to tell you that he's a liar. And I'm here to tell you He has no victory in your life. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is saying, I placed a dipping tool in your hand. And you and I got some work we need to do. Because the truth of the matter is, is that Matt is not going to be connected to the people that Scott is. And Matt may not be connected to all the people that Dale or Keith is or Hannah or Sean for that matter. Sean's over there working in Franklin. And yes, I go to church in Franklin, but I I may never meet most of the people that Sean works with. I hope maybe one day they'll all show up at Bible study. But you know what? The truth of the matter is, is that God has placed you and I. And and don't let the devil lie to you and tell you you don't have no gifts. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that God has not placed tools in your life to be used in the lives of others to bring them into the kingdom. Because that's not true. 
Now the truth is, is that the enemy wants to pervert those things in our lives. He wants to steal and to kill and to destroy our lives. He wants to make our lives naught. Amen. He wants to make it nothing. That in that day when we look into the eyes of our Redeemer, that we wouldn't hear those words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. But I'm here to tell you that that doesn't have to be the end of the story. Amen. God wants you and I to, be, to, to step up, to, to walk in the victory that He's already paid for. Amen. And to begin to have a mindset like He does. To begin to see people the way that He sees people. That's, you know, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but I have to tell you that that's really what the Lord put on my heart tonight. And I think that when it's all said and done, we're about to wrap this up, we're going to pray. And we're going to ask God to do that work in our heart. Amen. To make us hungry for the lost. To make us hungry for the hurting. To make us be able to begin to see people differently than maybe the way that we saw them last week. Amen? And not to just pass over people and think that they're insignificant. And not to just assume that that people aren't ready or that they're not worthy to receive the gospel. Amen? And that God would do a work in our hearts and in our minds. Alright. So Jesus needed the woman, for those of you who didn't, if you didn't hear... She had something. She brought her tool with her. She, she had her tool with her, man. She was going to draw water, brother. She left in there at the well of the No, nah, well, not that you know, not that I read, you know. Uh, and so she brought a tool with her, is what I'm under the impression. But you know what? The point of the well, I mean, because you know, if, the, if it was at the well, why did Jesus need her? You know, was it just you know? I don't know. Maybe he was. Just giving her an opportunity to, to, you know, for a blessing, I suppose, just like he gives to us. And you know what? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to you and I sometimes. Why would he even choose to use us? But he has. We're part of the equation. You know, people have asked me before, so let me ask you something, bro. If I don't get right and I don't walk right and I don't make, you know, I don't uh, reach out to the people that God has placed in my path, does that mean that they're going to hell? I'm not saying God can't raise somebody else up. I mean, surely he can. But at the same time, who do you think is going to do it? If you and I don't do it, who's going to do it? Amen? So Jesus is saying, we got work to do. I need something from you. I need you to serve me through what's in your hands. Amen? And He's placed things in our lives. He's placed things in our hands. Sometimes it's just our personality. Sometimes we're just people. We're people people. We can... Engage people in conversation. Some of us have a, a personality that people like and it's just about being nice. But you know what? It's not enough just to be nice to somebody. I've been telling people that lately too. It, no, it's not true that it's okay just to live your life. You're going to have to open your mouth sooner or later. Don't get me wrong. Don't open your mouth till you start walking right. Amen? Because sometimes we call, you'll do like I've done, and you cause more offense and damage to the kingdom than you do good for the kingdom. So let's get our lives right. But let me tell you, sooner or later, we're probably going to have to open our mouth. We may, you may not be as loud as Matt. You know, you may not talk as fast as Matt. But the truth is, is that you're probably going to have to talk. You're probably going to have to say something. You're going to need to let him know. No, Jesus loves you, man. He loves you enough to send his son. I mean, God sent his son to die for you. You need to know that. There's hope. Jesus was offering something. Amen. And that brings me to my next point. My next point in verse 9 is this, is that then the woman of Samaria... Let's see here. I'm sorry. The, the, the second point of that same verse was this. Number one, she had something Jesus needed to get from her. The second thing was this, is that it appears to me, I mean, you, you go back and you read the passage for yourself and you tell me if you see something else. I don't see anybody else in this story. It, it doesn't seem as though this is the time of the day when everybody's hustling and bustling around the well. We've already come to that conclusion that it seems as though this is not the, the time of the day whenever most people draw water from the well. And Jesus' disciples have gone to town. And it appears to me that it's just Jesus and this woman. And that they're having a, 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 an encounter and it's just them. And, you know, the Bible's real clear about that, that the disciples were gone. And one of the things that I wanted to point out to you was this, is that through this encounter... As we continue to read the story of this woman, she's going to gain a lot of revelation. She's going to gain revelation about the sin in her life. 
Because when it all comes down, there's a couple of main sticking points in this passage of Scripture. And one of them is is that Jesus is going to call her out for her sin. He's going to call it out like it is. Because, see, that's what's standing between her and the Lord. That's what's standing between her and her proper understanding. There's something, there's a big elephant in the room and it's, and it's glaring and it's a problem and Jesus needs to introduce her to it. So it's not that He's being mean. No, what He's doing is He's being kind. He's being loving. He's being compassionate. See, a lot of times people are like, man, I don't like to hear that preacher talk about all that sin, but you've got to understand something. You can't, the good news starts with bad news. And you can't shrink back from the truth that it's sin that separates not just the people out there in the world, but Christians today. We want to know why we're not walking right. We want to know why we're not seeing the victory that we need in our life. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're dabbling. Sometimes we're dabbling with stuff we ain't got no business dabbling with. I know that that was the case for me. But she's about to get revelation about the sin in her life. She's about to gain revelation about the truth regarding Messiah. She's about to gain revelation about living water. See, she's going out there for physical water. But what Jesus is about to offer her, she needs it more than her physical body needs water. Because He's offering new life. And this has been the theme of the Gospel thus far. This has been the theme of the Gospel thus far. And the theme is this, is that we're transitioning from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. We're transitioning from outward religion only being able to do so much for humanity. And that what Jesus is providing is a change on the inside. That's what the miracle of the wedding of Cana was all about. There were six pots representing humanity. And Jesus changed the inside of the vessel. And that's what He's coming to provide for you today. That's what He's coming to provide for me. That's what He's coming to provide for all those people that He brings in our path is a change on the inside. And how does He do that? He talked to Nicodemus about it. He said, unless a man is born again, he can't see it. He can't see it. He can't enter the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born again. And Nicodemus, once again, caught up in the natural. The six pots were made out of clay. They came from the earth. Natural. The best that the earth had to offer. Nicodemus is caught up in his natural mind. Can't think past natural birth. Jesus is trying to bring him into a new realm. Trying to bring him into a spiritual realm. Talking, to, Trying to get him to understand that there's more out there than what you're thinking. Amen. And he's trying to tell him about a spiritual rebirth. Where, where the inside of man has changed. Amen. And how does that take? place just as Moses, Moses lifted the serpent on the on the pole amen so must the son of man be lifted up and I will draw men unto me that that's how the serpent was going to be defeated by Jesus being lifted up from the earth on the cross amen and then now we're here we are at this particular juncture and here this woman is and she's seeking for natural water because she has a physical thirst that needs to be dealt with and what Jesus is offering is something completely different he's offering something to, to, to quench her spiritual thirst he's offering something that's going to change her on the inside she's been looking for fulfillment. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but everything that she's looked for, time and time, it's the same old thing, man. I'm not going to spell it out for you. You go back and read it, but she's been trying the same old thing day after day, year after year, time after time, thinking, when is she going to realize that it's not going to bring the desire, the fulfillment to what she's looking for? But yet she tries it over and over again, and it's just leaving a trail of pain in her life over and over again, and here Jesus comes offering spiritual life. Here Jesus comes offering living water. A change on the inside. Amen? Alright. Let's look at verse 9 and we're going to wrap this thing up. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. I wanted to point out to you that maybe this seems redundant to you, but this was the theme of tonight. Jesus' intentions are completely different than any man she's ever encountered before. Jesus doesn't think like the world. Jesus doesn't act like the world. Jesus offers something that the world can't offer. See, what, she, what every man has ever offered her before has only left her deeper in the hole. But what Jesus is offering her is salvation. What Jesus is offering her is a spiritual renewal. What Jesus is offering her is hope from a life of misery and pain. Amen? 
Jesus transcends that which is normal for society. You know, there's a good possibility that maybe she's being a little sarcastic here. In other words, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask his drink of me? In other words, oh, you Jews think that we Samaritans are a bunch of half-breeds until you need something. Maybe that's how she's talking to Jesus. I don't know. There's no way to prove it. At least not in the language and, and, and you know, the Greek scholars I read behind. Sometimes you can prove later on there's, she makes a comment that make, maybe makes it look like she's kind of flirting with him and you can kind of see that in the language a little bit. But the truth of the matter is is that there's no way to prove it. But maybe she was being sarcastic. But you know what ends up happening? Is that she's going to find out that what Jesus is offering is something altogether different, amen, than what she's ever had before. And I just wanted to close by asking this question. What about you? What about, what about you, uh, man or woman of God? What are you offering the world around you? Amen? You know, whenever, whenever you come into contact with somebody that, that needs help, you know, and uh, let's just say it's a person of the opposite sex, and that, let's say that person's attractive. Let's, let's, let's just pretend for a second of a hypothetical situation. Timothy 2.22. Huh? Timothy 2.22. Quote it for me, brother. Run. Run. <laughs> well, you know, and, but this is the point that I'm trying to make. No, that's cool. That's what Joseph did. It worked for him. Well, to some extent. The point that I want to make is this, is that the whole theme of tonight was, was that there's people out there that are in pain. There's people out there that are hurting. You know, I can't get it across enough. They need to have an encounter with Jesus. And my question to you is this, is that just because there's a person of the opposite sex, does that mean that we can't pray for them? Does that mean that we can't speak into their life? Some people in the church would teach you that. I think it's garbage. Well, your wife might... No, I think, I think, that, I think that if your wife Amen. knew that you were walking in, in the freedom and victory that she wanted you walking in and that there was a woman that needed help and you were going to pray with her, amen? You think your wife ain't praying for no men? No, I know your wife. And if there's a man that needs prayer, she's going to lay hands on that brother and pray for him. And, and that's the whole point that I'm trying to make. Is that Jesus is offering something different than all the men in her life ever offered her before. And that's the question that I have for us tonight. Whenever we see a person of the opposite sex, and even if they're attractive, what's going through your mind? I'm not trying to beat nobody down tonight, but I mean, are you thinking like, yeah, I'd like to touch her? You know? You, you know what I'm saying? Or are you thinking, I'd like to allow God to use me in this girl's life, or whatever the case? I guess all I'm saying is, is that, you know, even as a Christian, i I got to be honest with you, as a Christian and married... Early on, I had a problem with flirting. I didn't. I never intended to do nothing. I didn't. I never intended to actually cheat on my wife. And thank God, I never did. But I have to tell you that that old man needed to die, bro. That's a bunch of garbage, you know. And uh, of course, y'all. You know, some many of you in here aren't married. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that spiritual. Well, what I'm trying to get at is is that you may come across the, your future mate one day that you're going to marry. And I'm not saying that you can't ever be physically attracted to a woman or that a woman can't be physically attracted to a man if you're not married. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to per- portray here. But what I'm trying to say is, is that overall, what's driving you? Are we being spiritually minded or are we being carnally minded? Are we thinking like the world or are we thinking like, like the God that we serve? That says, hey, trust in me. Wait on me. Allow me to use you as a vessel in other people's lives. Amen. Allow me to change you on the inside so that you can be used on the outside. And if you really put him first and you really put his will first in other people's and, and allow him to use you in other people's lives, then you know what's going to happen is, is that before you know it, all the desires of your heart will probably start coming to pass. But the truth of the matter is, is if you're out there chasing them in your own strength, you just going to keep on like that Samaritan woman, finding yourself in the same old mess time after time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you in prayer, Lord. And I just thank you for your word tonight. And I lift up every individual in this room tonight. Lord, it seems as though to me, I know you were screaming it to my heart. I hope it came across to someone here tonight. 
that you have a desire to use each and every one of us in those people's lives out there where you've placed us in their lives. I pray, Lord God, that you would do the work in us that you need to do in us. I pray that you would prepare us, Lord, to to where we could be used by you. I pray that you would change our minds, Lord. Change our minds to where we have the renewed mind, the, the mind of Christ, to where we think like you, that you were compassionate, Lord, that you were selfless. I pray that we would no longer serve our own selfish desires. I pray that you would make it just so clear to our hearts, Lord, that the time is short and that there's people out there that need you, Lord. I pray that you would help us to trust in your finished work. I pray, Lord God, like it says, and I believe it's 1 Corinthians 5, 7, that we would purge out the old leaven, which represents sin, because Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, Lord. I pray that we would remember that you purchased us with a high price, Lord God. I pray that we would remember that we're not our own, but that we've been purchased by your precious blood, that you've ransomed us off the slave market, that you've redeemed us, Lord, that you've given everything that you had, And now all you ask is for us to give ourselves back over to you. I pray that you would make that real to our hearts by the power of your spirit, Lord. And I pray for each and every person in this room that maybe they've never been filled to overflowing with your spirit, Lord. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. I pray for each and every one of them, Lord God, that you would begin to entice them, Lord God. To desire more of you. That you would begin to entice them, Lord, to seek you. To pray earnestly, Lord God, that they would receive your power, Lord. That they would receive being endued with power from on high so that they could be the witnesses that you've called them to be because none of us can do it in our own strength, Lord. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.